Hello, Winchester. Hello, America. It's Visual Radio Live, and it is November 1st, 2012, at five days to Election Day. Election Day will be after Guy Fawkes Day in England, which is like our 4th of July. In England, they have Guy Fawkes Day, and he, uh, well, he was an interesting man, but they, they use a lot of firecrackers and fireworks and such in November. We do it in July when it's a little warmer, but that's okay. Peter Noon's birthday is November 5th, which is Guy Fawkes Day. We'll send him an email. Maybe he'll phone in. Well, it won't, we won't be on the air on the 5th. We'll be on the air on the... Uh, Where's your mic? The mic is here on the phone. I always leave it there. Um, he'll, he, we'll phone him in. Maybe next week he'll call in. Anyway, we got lots of stuff to talk about tonight. Johnny Byers will be on the phone, and Frank Delastrito will be talking about two movies. Two movies tonight, and so we're on our way. I'll be talking to Harry in a couple of minutes. Winchester is on the front page of the Boston Globe today. Don't know if you saw it. Um, interesting article. Obama delivers a vow in visit to hobbled New Jersey. Bipartisanship. It, it's great. Right before the election, you've got Obama with Chris Christie. You've got Mike Bloomberg, the New York mayor today, endorsing Barack Obama. Even Geraldo Rivera on Fox is uh, a little upset with the GOP. So Geraldo Rivera is uh, on a rampage, too, that you know, the GOP has been hammering, hammering away at Libya. The GOP never hammered away at Dick Cheney in Halliburton, never hammered away at the Iraq War and the Yellow Cake. Speaking of which, Colin Powell endorsed... Barack Obama. You got Christie, Bloomberg, Powell, and even Geraldo for what Geraldo's worth. A new state audit shows that the Winchester housing director, who also kept a full time law practice, filed 16 conflicting time cards showing him in court when he claimed to be at the authority, undermining his insistence that he juggled two careers simply by working nights and weekends. Joseph M. Lally, 59, abruptly resigned his 73 grand a year housing authority position after 11 years on the job on October 5th, days before publication of a Globe story that featured Lally, Lally gagging, oh sorry, prominently as an example of housing di authority executive directors who face little accountability for their work. Now, you all have probably read about the Chelsea Housing Authority and Tim Murray's involvement in that. And then the Medford Housing Authority, and you know that we're smack dab in the middle of it, people, because Visual Radio went over to the Medford Housing Authority with the camera on April 18th. And what did we do? We filmed and we asked Uncle Gene McGillicuddy. Uncle Gene McGillicuddy. I never realized he was the mayor's uncle. I thought it was his cousin or something, but he's literally Mayor McGlynn's uncle. And Uncle Gene's a nice old guy. I like him. But, you know... The mayor's uncle on the board of directors of a housing authority in Medford is a little sketchy, etch-a-sketchy. So uh, Uncle Gene was nice enough and told us he was related to the mayor, and that Governor Deval Patrick appointed him, and three or four days later, Governor Deval Patrick unappointed him, and Bob Cavell left. But the problem here, people, is that Bob Cavell got just a slap on the wrists and early in the, earlier in the year, Patricia DePaula Cavell, his wife, the sister of the late Sheriff Jim DePaula, she got a slap on the wrist from Martha Coakley. So Martha Coakley will go after some of these housing authorities with a vengeance and others, uh, the kid gloves, because they're part of the McGlynn crony thing. So anyway... You'll hear this later tonight. The police chief in Medford has given us permission. We have permission to picket Mayor McGlynn's November 7th State of the City Address over at the Sheriff's Office, Century Bank. So um, where the mayor's father had a job for three years at 80 grand a year. And his cousin was the special sheriff. And a city councilor works at the Sheriff's Department. So he makes about 100 k between the Sheriff's Department and the city council, and his uncle, 
is the president of the city council in Medford. So if you think you got it bad here, Winchester with uh, Lally. Well, okay. Before we make our phone call, we're going to uh, go here. The 11 page state audit, dated October 23rd, but written before Lally's sudden resignation, is addressed to Laura McGlynn. All right, I did that on purpose. Laura Glenn. I mean, it's just, it was too easy. Laura McGlynn, Glenn, Glenn McGlynn, of the law firm McGlynn and McGlynn and McGlynn and McGlynn, LLC. Uh, chair of the five member Winchester Housing Authority Board Commission. The board has 10 days to respond to the draft. Glenn did not return email and phone messages, no doubt. But when the Globe first asked her about his ability to do jobs at once, two jobs at once, she expressed support for Lally. He is a hard worker. I really don't care what he does in his off hours so long as the agency is well run. Okay, then Boston Globe today, November 1st, page A7. Okay, the report challenges Glynn's contention that the housing authority was well run under Lally too. In three of the eight rental units that auditors inspected, they found 10 instances of non-compliance with the state sanitary code, such as peeling paint, sealing water stains, roof deterioration, exterior siding falling off, walkways in disrepair, collapsing fence, rubbish and debris in yard, and disintegrated caulking in sink. All right, so now you know why they like to ban shows, TV shows in Medford. Because we read the facts from the newspaper and Mayor McGlynn is so thin-skinned, he has a media blackout on the city. He might as well be the editor of the weekly paper. He's the de facto editor. So, there you go. Winchester, that was our fun for tonight. And Hollywood, California? Yes, it is. Harriet Shock. Hi, Joe. How are you? I'm fine. So you didn't get the big hurricane we got? No, but are you in the middle of something? I, I'm really geographically challenged, and I don't know anything except about New York and some parts of Connecticut. You're in Massachusetts. Are you in the middle of it? We got a lot of rain. It was supposed to last three days. We only got about mm, 30 hours of it, uh -huh. maybe 36. Uh, we got a lot of hard rain and a lot of wind. Now, there are trees down. There are uh, things that come with it, but we really escaped. We escaped this massive storm. And so you have electricity and you never lost it? Right. Now, um, a fellow I do business with, he lives in Newton, Mass., which is about uh, eight, ten miles away, and he has a generator. So they, his family lost power. Ooh. We're more towards Boston. I'm five miles north of Boston. I see. Well, I have a, a, there was a woman in New Jersey who flew me up there for a house concert. I think I may have mentioned that to you after she saw Irene in time. And um, she was completely without everything. And she was in line this morning at 5.30 for gasoline, and there were like 100 people behind her. She's lucky if it's only 100. I saw a news report where they were in New Jersey, three or four miles of cars waiting for gas. Oh, God. They, they would never have gotten it, would they? I mean, how could they have that much gas? Right, and, and they had um, an aerial view of the highway, which was just stretching for miles and miles of cars. Oh, that's so sad. I mean, she couldn't get home without getting gas, so it was really kind of dangerous. You, um, I'm glad our president stepped right up and uh, got in the thick of it, and I feel good that at least uh, they're, they're quickly moving on all this stuff because it was a, a major, major disruption of life. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's, it, I heard. You know, I've heard people say that he stepped right up and, and took care. I mean, you can't wait for FEMA, right? I mean, you have no electricity. So. And, and, you know, um, national, uh, I won't say the company names. There are electric companies here, and I don't know which one, but they were so overwhelmed with calls that people were getting angry because they, they couldn't even get a good time frame on when their electric would be back. Yeah, they, they announced it on the news now. Apparently, New York may have electricity by Saturday, I think I heard. 
The subway is running very, uh, just a couple of stops in New York, but at least they got a couple of stops. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know they were running at all. I know they've closed certain bridges and things because the water was, tunnels, I mean, the water was all the way up to the top of the tunnel. <laughs> I mean, this is insane. I just finished reading Isaac Storm about the 1900 storm in Galveston. So when I heard hurricane of major proportions, I was just terrified. I mean, you know. They didn't know what was coming back then, and the weatherman himself told everybody everything was going to be fine. So at, at least they knew a little bit ahead of time on this one. You know about the full moon, in effect, too, that night? No, what? Well, it was a full moon the night of the hurricane, and um, there are all sorts of conspiracy theories that certain countries are able to manipulate the cirrus clouds and make things happen like droughts or too much rain or these storms. I don't know if I can buy into it yet, but it seems very suspicious. You'd have a convergence of three weather fronts all at once on a full moon. Oh. So you had the, the, some storm coming from the west, Arctic air coming from the north, and this hurricane coming from the south. They call it the perfect storm. And it wreaks havoc because it's just this massive a thing, a gargantuan thing that just uh, invades. So are we to, to start wondering if this was a terrorist attack? Uh, there is even conspiracy uh, from the, the right, the fanatical right, saying that Obama did it right before the election. Oh, oh right. I know. I know. I don't know. You know, I, I can't say that I am immune con completely to conspiracy theories because I lived through the JFK assassination, okay? So I, I do believe some of the things that are very compelling I hear on um, Coast to Coast. <laughs> but for the most part, you know, no, it takes two people to keep a secret for a conspiracy to work. That's correct. Now that, that's rare in, in this world for, for even one person to be able to keep a secret, so... You know, and when you talk about the JFK thing, I look at Paul Wellstone and Mel Carnahan, these Democrats that went down in plane ca crashes during election times. Mm -hmm. I find that very chilling. Well, almost everyone connected to that situation went down in flames one way or another, and including Garrison, who I think was on to it. But don't get me started. <laughs> I'm from Dallas. <laughs> oh, oh, I forgot. Yeah. So there you go. I was nine years old Where at the time. Talking? And no, it was, you know, the, the Kennedy thing, uh, the world would be different had Kennedy lived. Yeah, oh, that's for sure. And uh, the world would be different had Al Gore taken the presidency he earned. But now I'm going on to other topics, you know. Okay. <laughs> uh, how are you, Harriet? What are you doing musically right at the moment? Well, I, I've just finished writing a melody to one of, uh, a, to a lyric that one of my students and, and co-workers, and Andrea Ross Green, you know, she um, is in my band, she sings back up, and she's a good friend, and she's been studying with me for 11 years, and she wrote a lyric I loved so much that I wrote the melody to it. It's called Thank You for Your Service, and it's for veterans and servicemen all everywhere i mean whether no matter what war you were in no matter what you did it if it's present past or whatever because she she had some servicemen in her family and she didn't really you know want to talk about it especially because like most of us who are against war to begin with she kind of she knew it was a dirty job but someone had to do it but she started interviewing servicemen and they're all against war too so we decided, you know, that she would write this lyric and to thank them because, you know, I wouldn't want to go through that. And anyway, so she wrote this wonderful lyric, and, and I said I wanted to write the melody, and so a lot is happening with it already. But I, I can't really talk about what, but I feel good that we acknowledge these people for what they've done. I'm so glad Andrea's in your band. Oh, yeah, she's... Uh, She's been in my band for a long time. She sang on my most recent CD, and, you know, she. whenever I perform in public, there she is. And so now we can each sing it. She sings it when it's her show. I sing it when it's mine. 
And you're absolutely right. The, the veterans don't get enough, not only props, but enough attention. And, and again, uh, I think our president, our current president, Barack Obama, I hope he continues being our president. I think he cares about veterans. Yeah, well, I think, actually, I think both of them care about veterans. I mean, how can you not like veterans? But the problem is the laws, after they get home, you know, don't take care of them enough. And if you really want my viewpoint, I read an article recently that there, are two, there were two soldiers who were getting 54 psychiatric medications at one time. I mean, it's no wonder they're killing themselves more than ever they're all being medicated don't really we shouldn't get started on this because i feel very very strongly against it um medication across the board there's too much of it um yeah. i'll go off on a little tangent when i watch the cable news programs i'm inundated with uh Pharma commercials ads? Hmm? pharmaceutical ads oh it's you know i know you're into home home up homeopathy is that it well you know my father was a dermatologist and he was an actual doctor of medicine and it's not that i think you know you shouldn't have those by a long shot but in particular the psychiatric profession that is being sent you know their sons are being sent to college by the pharmaceutical companies this and that the problem with them is any natural symptom of childhood is considered an aberration and something that has to be medicated so when you listen to these commercials for these drugs, you hear in fine print on the bottom after you see butterflies and people all happy could cause suicide, murder, and all these things that they, they're contraindicated because of. And so they get away with it because they just assign the name of a medical condition to something that is completely unscientific. And Dr. Zaz, who was a psychiatrist, blew the whistle on them in like the 50s. He died last week, so there's a lot of publicity about this. And I, I'm telling you, I wouldn't want to have gone to school to be a psychiatrist right now because the public opinion is finally turning completely against them. But it's really the culprits are the, are the pharmaceutical companies. Oh, I, I agree 100%. And, and, and this stuff is going into our water system, into our food supply. Uh, you can't escape it, even if you're a hardcore Christian scientist. Um, it's, it's everywhere. And, you know, I don't want that stuff on my body. So, you know, anyway, I don't know what this has to do with my movie, but it's very, I'm very passionate about it, I must say. Oh, we're having a conversation. Visual Radio's subtitle is Digression. <laughs> you've been on it okay. before. You know, it's a conversation, and, and, and it just seems to work. Um, it's been 17 years, Harriet, you know. Oh, my heavens. And we had George McGovern on, so I have a two-camera shoot of George McGovern. Oh. Which, you know, we, we talked about this before. You were gracious enough to find a public access show of Nick Vinay. And I have those tapes. I should make you a DVD. Oh, I would love that. But it was your hard work because I said, Harriet, someone's got to have Nick on public access. And you found a fellow. Oh, okay. And I have the tapes. He, he was gracious enough to mail them to me. And our friend Nick... You know, uh, it's just great. And I just thank you for introducing me to him. Oh, absolutely. I just talked to his brother the other day because they live in Baltimore, and I was worried that trees were going to blow their house down or something, but he assured me everybody was okay. Now, we're going to talk about your movie. Valerie Vinay is a friend of yours, right? Yeah, uh-huh. And she was the fifth monkey? Yeah. The fifth monkey, but she's in a science fiction movie right now. She's taping right now. She is? Oh, I'm so happy. Because Tell about that. our mutual friend that I introduced you to, you introduced me to Nick, and I, a sound man, and I introduced you to Dinky Dawson, a sound man. Oh, right. Well, and Nick wasn't really a sound man. He was a producer. But, uh, but uh, Dinky, he's great. I saw him just recently when, um, you know, he was in town. Yes, and I know Nick is a producer and an A and R man, but he did sound for the Beatles. That's where I was going. He did. Nick did sound for the Beatles and Frank Sinatra. He did the live sound. Oh, I see. Isn't that wild? Well, yeah. Nineteen sixty six tour because I'm producing a boxed set for Bobby Hebb, who sang Sonny. 
Uh-huh. And Nick must have been his sound engineer because Bobby opened for the Beatles on that tour. Wow. How's that for a connection? So we're all connected. It is. Yeah, well, I saw Dinky when he was in town, when Spanky and our gang was playing uh, the coffee gallery backstage. I adore Spanky. What a voice. Yeah, she's really wonderful. It was so great to hear her. I would have loved for you to... Did you jump on the stage with her? No, I, I didn't that night. I was just in the audience. I was telling Dinky, she has to call Harriet up on stage. Two legends in one room. <laughs> well, she made a big deal of it, but I didn't get up there. I can't remember why, but there was no need to. I was having so much fun in the audience. She's just such a great entertainer. She did a Beatles fest out here. She was so much fun. She brought the house down with Sunday Will Never Be the Same. Yeah, I bet. So Valerie's doing a movie, and you have a movie, and my review isn't up yet, so I'm going to ask you to talk about it. Okay. And um, how long has it been out now? Well, it was released on the 3rd of October in Los Angeles, the 17th in New York. I hope some people got there while they could still get to a movie. Yeah. Um, it's still here. Um, it was in Palm Springs. It's been a, a number of places. I can tell by the reviews that crop up. But um, it's supposed to be going to Dallas because that's where I'm from, and, and I really want to go there and get all my old friends <laughs> to see it. Because, you know, with an entire career uh, as a singer-songwriter, uh, I haven't really done this much of this kind of work, but I was in the play for a year that preceded the movie. I think you knew about that. Mm -hmm. So it was um, an interesting experiment for Henry to do a movie from a play he had written, even though the play is a little different from the movie because there are some scenes in the movie that were not in the play and some scenes in the play that were missing from the movie. But he kind of did an experimental thing with showing part stage and part real life, supposedly, which is, you know, the movie. <laughs> So it, I loved doing it. It was so much fun, and the cast was just so fantastic. Now, how many nights do you think you played on stage with it before the movie? Oh, I knew at one time. It was something like 110 performances, but I could have that confused with some other number. It was 10 months, wow. or, uh, you know, and it was uh, three to four nights a week. So, you know, I would need a calculator. <laughs> oh, no, that that's amazing. So... Okay, where I'm going with this is, how many of the performances did they film in their entirety? Oh, none. I mean, we shot the, the, we shot the scenes that were on stage at a different time entirely. Because, you know, in order to get close-ups, it would be very disruptive to an audience to have a camera in there. So we, sh we did it on stage for the, the camera, and then we did it on location. Oh, wow. So, because nowadays with plays, with video being so accessible, remember uh, back in the 60s, Peter Pan with Mary Martin? Uh-huh. That was like a stage show that they put on TV, but it was just so marvelous. Yeah, but this, this is, uh, as you know, I haven't seen it, considerably different from that. Plus, um, Henry shoots with film, so, it, it, you know, it, it wouldn't have worked on video and then mixing it and all that. I was just in a studio yesterday where they were showing me the film transferring to digital because they're going to be authoring the Bobby Hebb DVD. Oh. So they were, they were showing, and they do the Hendrix stuff, which I like the connection where Bobby knew Jimi Hendrix. So we're using the same facility, and they were showing me the, a, a massive facility here in Boston, and they had the, the film being transferred to digital, and it's, it's amazing. Uh, because a lot of the movie houses are, are going to get rid of their film. Oh. They, 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 some of the great classics, they're just going to destroy the reels of film. And I think, why don't you just auction them off? Yeah, that's true. Well, Henry, in this last film, did, you know, end up digital or something like that. I can't remember how it works, but he always goes to film for the final deal. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, now, my question to you, because I'm not sure, the soundtrack, do you have anything to do with the soundtrack? 
Nothing. Not at all. This one, I was just acting. That's kind of good, Harriet. So you have a separation from your what you're known for. Yeah, I mean, um, those songs preceded me by a long shot. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I would like to have written those old standards, but I didn't. <laughs> well, no, I'm I'm just asking any incidental music that goes along, you know, in any mood thing. Um, no, this was the first movie of his in quite a while that I didn't do music for, but. Um, that was fine. I loved seeing my name under starring instead of under music. <laughs> <laughs> it's a transition and a good one. Yeah, well, I still plan to do music for him, but just didn't on this one. I'm going to get back to the movie in a second, but I'd like to ask, because I, I kind of know the story, the demo that got the deal for the love theme to Barry Gordy's Last Dragon. Oh, boy, that was the story. Yeah, I uh, was signed... To Joe Bat, it was actually Stone Diamond because that was the ASCAP company. With Misha Siegel, who wrote the music for that beautiful thing, um, and we were told by someone at the company that there was supposed to be a love song, and we wrote it. And she wasn't thrilled with the lyric, but I knew that she liked analogies, so I wrote another lyric called First Time on a Ferris Wheel," and we took it to Mr. Gordy in the middle of the night, as I recall. And he said, what do you mean a love song? This movie doesn't have a love theme. And so we played it for him, and he threw the cushion he was sitting on on the floor, and he gets on the phone, and he calls the head of TriStar in the middle of the night, says, you've got to come over here right now. I'm rewriting the end of the movie for this song. I mean, <laughs> this is such a great story. You know, I always wanted to tell it on... Johnny Carson, but then he retired. But anyway, so sure enough, it ended up the end of the movie, and um, as she's going up or he's going up, somebody's going up in a elevator or something, or in this, you remember, the lift lifted them up, and, and they sang this song. Now, the trick was Carl Anderson, one of the greatest singers of all time, he, he died way too early. But he was singing the demo, and it was just magnificent. And he has one of those, well, he was Judas in Jesus Christ Superstar. He has one of those big voices that is like no other, you know. Yes. And Smokey Robinson sang it in the movie. And Smokey is a fabulous singer and writer, but it was a different kind of voice. So it was difficult to get the performance that Smokey really wanted to give the song. But it turned out fine. It's just that if you go on my website on the front page, you can click on Carl Anderson singing First Time on a Ferris Wheel, and it will blow your mind. Uh, he then put it out on his own album. But anyway, it came out, and it was the love theme song for The Last Dragon, which has become kind of a cult-followed uh, movie, you know. Um, it's very funny. It's kind of a spoofy sort of movie, but it starred Vanity and, and this young man who was a kung fu expert. He was studying kung fu, and he was a virgin, and he lived in New York City, and he, he fell in love with vanity. And I thought, what in the world do I have in common with this young African-American man? And I thought, well, I've fallen in love for the first time, so I tried to write what we had in common. And 30 people have sung it now, so apparently some sort of nerve was touched. Roberta Flack did it too, right? No, she did a song of mine called Happiness that I wrote with Smitty, William D. Smith. Sorry. But, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, no, but um, Nancy Wilson, the jazz singer, and and um, Gloria Loring sang the duet with uh, Carl Anderson, and just a lot of people have sung it at weddings and all sorts of places and recorded it. But the definitive version was Carl Anderson. Now, you said it was the demo, so on your website's the demo that you cut with Carl? No, the, the demo was with Carl, and that's what got the deal on the movie. But then Carl recorded it himself on his next album with, I think it was Columbia or, or whatever label he was on, and had Gloria Loring sing the duet. It was oh. a follow-up duet to Friends and Lovers that they had done. Interesting. So, how did, can we ask how you got signed to Stone Diamond? Well, I had been working with Hal Davis over there 
Misha and I had been writing some songs and showing them to him. I went through an interesting period in the 80s because in the 70s, you know, I had written for Cold Gems, Green Gems, um, you know, EMI, and had made three albums for Russ Regan on 20th Century Records. Then when disco came in and I left the label and everything, I was kind of not sure what I wanted to do. So I met Misha Siegel, and he was a brilliant composer of the genre that he wrote in, but I kind of abandoned my own composing and just wrote lyrics for him. So during the period I was signed to Joe Bad, I, I'm not sure they even knew that I was a composer, although I did write a song for Barry Gordy as a gift that I wrote words and music for that he was very fond of. But anyway, so we got signed as a team, and that's how that happened. Hal Davis brought us in. I met Barry Gordy. He bought my existing catalog, which was a lot of my, my songs by myself and everything. And then we wrote for them for a few years. And um, then I left. And, you know, I can't <laughs> I've had so many publishing deals, I can't remember if that was the last one or if there was another one after that. I haven't seen Russ Reagan in 20 years. Um, oh, I have. He's, he's doing great. Really? So, um... Wow. I'll send you an email to tell him I said hi. I will. I, um, I don't talk to him very often, but I just love him. And he, he's great. So, um, okay, we'll get back to your movie in a second, but I want to ask, what was the demo that got the deal for Hollywood Town, 20th Century? Um, well, I had just signed a publishing deal with Roger Gordon at Screen Gems Music, which was later EMI Music. And we made demos in the studio with David Carr and some people. We just, you know, we were making demos. We didn't know. And he was the publisher, so he was in the studio, too. So we took him to 20th, and Russ Regan wanted to sign me, and he said, who produced the demos? Well, really, you know, I guess Roger, but he was just sort of there. And they were head arrangements with chord charts, and David Carr had a lot to do with it, and I was playing the piano and, you know, whatever. So Roger ended up producing the album. And then he uh, produced the second one. The point being that it was our publishing demos that got me the record deal. And um, I had two different record deals. I don't know if you know this, but I was signed to Columbia before I was signed to 20th. They had some humongous payola scandal. <laughs> And so everyone got dropped. I was signed by Jack Gold, who was quite a brilliant man. He produced my um, Johnny Mathis record on, the, on a song of mine. But anyway, he had signed me, and then all of his acts got dropped. And he was right under Clive Davis. Oh, and whenever okay. people would bring something to Jack, and Jack didn't like it, they would say, Jack, I think I'm going to have to go over your head on this one. And he would say... Over my head and around my back, the two most traveled paths in America. Hmm. That's how witty he was. He was really, he was amazing. And he just loved my writing, and, and I signed with him, and all I got out of it was a Peugeot, because when I got dropped, I just took the front money and ran. And then, 20th, I mean, uh, Cold Gems took me to Russ Regan and played him the, the demos, and he said, oh, I definitely want to sign her, even though he had another female on the label. You know, in those days, you couldn't have more than one, but he broke the rule. Well, the other female was on my show last week. Really? Maureen McGovern? Oh, no, no. Uh, Har uh, Genya Raven. Oh, okay. Well, I don't think she was on there at that time. Oh, okay. Right, because it was another fellow who signed her, not Russ Reagan. Yeah. Um, uh, and um, Patty Dahlstrom was on there around the same time. But the Maureen McGovern was the one who was signed when I was there. Oh, the morning after. Yeah. She was uh, a writer, so it didn't really matter. Okay, so now as a, a Harriet Shock fan, I want to know, was there music recorded at Columbia? Or maybe she was a writer, now that I think about it. Anyway, she didn't write that, though. Uh, no, I didn't record anything for Columbia. Oh. Finally gave me some front money and let me go. <laughs> Oh, uh, again, history might have been different. They were so eager to promote artists. Yeah, I know. It was 
It was a sad situation with, with 20th, because Russ Regan was such a real music man. He was like, you could tell that the guy really knew. The problem was distribution. I would get fan letters when I did television shows. We can't find your records in the stores. And Rolling Stone said if Patty Hearst had wanted not to be found, she should have been on 20th Century Records. Ooh. Uh, yeah, that's evil. But. And you know, he created a great double record set with Helen Reddy on it, uh, all this in World War II, the soundtrack. Oh, that's right. I know he did. And I gave it a great review on AMG. Oh, good. But like many of my AMG reviews, uh, well, not many, but some, uh, if a CD comes out, like one of the editors rewrote the review. I still have mine. I should send it to you. But then they rewrite them, so some of them get lost in the translation, if you will. Oh, well, why do they rewrite them? Because a CD comes out, and they want to review the CD version, and there's really no need to, but maybe they just love the record. And it's funny, because some of my reviews just disappear. Oh, that's unfortunate, yeah. My Batman 1943 serial disappeared, and I'm a little upset, but I say, I, you know, I've got the text. Because um, I was writing film reviews for them, too. Um, you know, Macrovision bought them for $82 million and everything changed. Oh. But I had a lot of fun writing, what, 5,000 essays I wrote for them. Yeah, that's a lot of work in nine years. Yeah. It's about 5,000 articles. Good heavens, Joe. You didn't know that, did you? I didn't know the number. It was, it's, it's staggering, if you think about it. Um, it really is. But all this in World War II was a lot of fun. Uh, Helen did The Fool on the Hill. Leo Sayer did, oh, uh... I don't know, maybe I Am the Walrus, uh, the Bee Gees are on it. A spectacular record, even if the movie didn't do well, it should have been huge. What did Helen Reddy do? I think she did The Fool on the Hill. Oh, okay. Um, it's just this great stuff was coming out on 20th Century. Was and it called All This in World War II? Yeah, the soundtrack to the. You could actually, you know, if you've got Netflix or something, probably watch the movie. It was a soundtrack to a film, all this in World War II. I gotcha. And Russ Reagan was the music director, I, I believe, if memory serves me. Uh, so he definitely was. I know he did that. Yeah, he's a great man. And, uh, and those are great records. And I'm so happy you're a movie star now. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> well, you can make more movies now. Oh, I would love that. You know, somebody saw the uh, just a preview of the movie, which I, I closed, you know, with, with a line. And she said, you should be the aunt or the sister next door in a sitcom. And I said, well, I would love that. <laughs> um, TV is, oh, who said it? One of the big, big actors. Oh, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer was on last night. And she said, um, TV is so... It has so much credibility now for movie stars. Yeah, uh, it's really true. And, and the whole medium is changing so quickly because everything will shift to the Internet at some point. Mm -hmm. The world as we know it is going to shift in a dramatic fashion. Uh, will we watch the Internet on our TV? I don't know. Uh, yeah, no, I know. I, what is that, that uh, little box, the Rojo or something that you can hook up so that you can get all of your Hulu Plus and everything onto your television? <laughs> uh, oh. You know, everyone and his brother will be uh, a star. Yeah. Singing Ain't No Way to Treat a Lady and Sunny. <laughs> it's <laughs> funny. I know everyone can make a, a record in their living room and a movie in their, you know, front yard. But you know what? They're still going to be Casablanca. That's right. Artist. <laughs> the, and the birds and great, great films. Now, do you find a lot of people covering you on the Internet? Do you find YouTubes popping up that uh, from people you never heard of? Yeah. Yeah, there's some really strange versions of my songs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I consider it flattering. You it's, should. And then also people make videos of my songs, which I really like because they use my records. And they just put their own pictures, and it's quite beautiful. I mean, I love that. You know, Bobby and I had envisioned a sunny video with flowers and a happy thing we wanted to be on people's desktop, just to make them happy. 
And didn't someone come and do a video of Sonny that's still on the web that we use it, uh, you know, on the website, but someone pretty much got the idea because, you know, it's sunshine, happiness, and they kind of got the idea that we were doing. I don't know, maybe they read our blog. I don't know, but there's a beautiful video of Sonny up there now. Oh, that's wonderful. So you're right. The fans do get creative, and they know Final Cut Pro and iMovie, and they're having a blast. I know. Well, you know, Dancing with My Father is all over the place because it was in that movie, Irene in Time, and I get calls constantly from people all over the country. I wrote that with Ron Troutman, by the way. He was my student. He wrote the lyric. And they're, they're making videos of it, and they want the sheet music. And <laughs> Yesterday I got a call from some woman in, uh, good Lord, in Kentucky in some technical school. She wants the sheet music. And so it's nice to know that that's the thing about Henry Daglam. He may not be mainstream, although he's made 18 films, thank you very much, but when he uh, goes to, like, when Netflix gets a hold of it, it goes everywhere. And his movies have been seen. Now, I know Irene in Time has been seen by almost every state because I have gotten inquiries from everyone and people doing their own videos. And some. Um, an interesting thing that happened was a man made a video who's connected to this group that educates single fathers or no absentee fathers trying to get them back to to actually participating and stepping up to the plate with their own children and they used that video uh, that they made which is beautiful of dancing with my father with this little child and her father and everything to try to pull at the heartstrings of these absentee fathers, and I, I was very proud that I was part of that. Oh, you should be. Harriet, you do tremendous work. I can't wait for you to come to Boston. We have to put some kind of mega concert together and have you perform. <laughs> or even just a house concert. <laughs> you know, I love those because they're so intimate and I get to meet everyone. But yeah, anything you want to do, I would love to be up there. I would love to see you here. You know, Genya Raven will be touring here in February, March. And I haven't seen her in years. It'll be awesome. I, I, I love my ladies of 20th century. Yes, I will give her my best. I'm so glad to hear she's going to be touring up there. She, I've got to send you her record. She, she told me to send it to you. I've got to get it to you. I'll mail it out hopefully by Saturday. Well, I just got a package today from you with a whole bunch of stuff, but hers isn't in there? No, I wanted to get you something, so I popped that stuff in the mail. Okay, well, good. Um, All right. But, That's yeah, good. i got to stay in better touch with everyone, so I... I find the U.S. mail is kind of fun. <laughs> I know. I, I hate to think of those postmen up there right now, but, you know, it says nothing holds them back, but I hope they're not trying to get in that tunnel that's all the way up water. I expected you to get that package on Monday. I mailed it Saturday night, and they're usually pretty good. Um, but today is Thursday, so, well, okay, five days. Yeah. No, that's okay. But isn't that more fun than email? Oh, a package. I know. It's so exciting. It's like when you're at camp and you get a letter from home. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So, you know, I try to do that. I try to stay with the U.S. Postal Service. That's right. Support them. Let's support them all we can. They're already eliminating Saturdays in some neighborhoods. Well, we'll help them because um, I sh make me Postmaster General. We'll have a lot of fun with the Postal Service. Yeah. Free Harriet Shock CDs to every postal customer. <laughs> I like the way you think, so. <laughs> Harriet, I want to talk more about the movie. Uh, I'll get the review up, and then maybe we can chat again. Oh, that would be wonderful. Because now we have a oh. film critic that I talked to in Texas about our movies that we're playing tomorrow night. We play public domain movies here. Oh, okay. Which is a big staple on public access, the free movies that you can play. And, you know, we've had uh, big movies with John Wayne and uh, great actors and actresses that you'd never think were in public domain. Oh, uh, so it's a whole other counterculture thing we do. Yeah. Oh, I think that's wonderful, Joe. I love old movies anyway. So if I were up there, I'd be watching them with you. So. Well, I'm going to stay in better touch. Harriet, congratulations on the movie. I'm so thrilled I have a copy. Oh, and me too. I'm so glad to talk to you, Joe. It's always so much fun and so easy. So call me back or we'll set up a, a, another little chat after you've put the review up. I'd love it. Thank you, Harriet. Take care. Okay. Good night. Hi. The great legendary Harriet Shock. Um.
she's just a dear friend and a wonderful songer. She's just one of my heroes, and I met her in 91. I had to go out to L.A. and meet Harriet Shock, and I'm so glad I did. And now we're friends. I can't believe it, because she's one of my favorite songwriters. <laughs> to become friends with your heroes is just amazing. Hey, John, we only got two minutes because we got to do the movie reviews. Okay, very quickly, um, it looks like the NHL season may be going by the boards very quickly because today the NHL commissioner announced that the, uh, the last stumbling block to canceling the season, the Winter Classic has been officially canceled, and that was the last bargaining chip that the Players Union had to use to get a deal. Well, I'm outraged because I'm not a hockey fan. You're probably not. But all these people, including my producer, Jeff Dearman, they earn their livelihood with hockey. And it's not fair to them. Well, what needs to happen now... The president needs to step in. No, no, no. I'll tell you what needs to happen. These, uh, uh, these, these, play, uh, these um, leagues, these major leagues, NHL, NBA, NFL, and whatever, have this thing called uh, the... the uh, of a restriction on it, which keeps you fans like us from suing them from something like this. If that restriction, which was put in in the 1800s, called antitrust exemption, was able to be removed, as a matter of fact, uh, during the steroid hearings back in the uh, late 90s up in Washington, there was threats of doing that. What that does, if you remove that antitrust exemption, among other things, it allows ticket prices go down and a famous word that you've taught me called class action lawsuit it allows fans like for instance with the nhl to go after the league and the players union in general for for striking well john i'm going to cut it short but i'm going to tell you this you gave me my headline for my blog tonight antitrust action against mayor of medford <laughs> Oh, God. It's we'll easy. talk later, Joe. Thanks, Johnny. Oh, oh, can you say this is John from Medford on Visual Radio? This is John from Medford on Visual Radio. Thanks, Johnny. Bye-bye. Bye. We're having fun here on Visual Radio. We really are. I could do five hours, and I have so much fun. I go straight out talking about movies. I need five hours, Frank. Okay, uh, tonight, all in a row? Sure. Okay. Tomorrow night at 9, what are we watching here in Winchester? You are watching Penny Serenade. Yes. Starring Cary Grant and Irene Dunn, and it is directed by George Stevenson. George Stevens. Irene Dunn what? Irene Dunn, a, a decent job in this movie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, George Stevens is uh, the director on the rise. He's 37 years old. He's made a, he's made a variety of movies. He's not going to hit his prime for about 10 years. When he in the 50s, he will make 1950s. He'll make Shane. He'll make A Place in the Sun, for which he gets Best Director Award. He'll make uh, Giant, for which he gets Best Director Award. So he becomes one of the leading directors. But now he's working his way out of the pack and up the up the line, and he's directing Penny Serenade. Now, Did they die at the end of Shane? What? Did they die at the end of Shane? Did who die at the end of Shane? That was the question in the movie The Negotiator. Oh. Uh, well, the guy I like best died at the end of Shane, but Shane rode off into the sunset. Well, that was the whole question um, that uh, Kevin Spacey is asked by Samuel Jackson. Okay. And they're arguing that Shane didn't die, and Shane did die, and, you know. Oh. No, Stark Wilson died. Shane, Shane rode off into the sunset. I, I wasn't aware of the debate, and if I had had the ability, I would have joined in. <laughs> Sometimes I warn your viewers about things in movies that they may not like. This is a movie very much about loss of child. Ooh. And, and the thing is, they keep losing children. There's a, I, you know, I won't give away the plot, but there's a miscarriage. There's an adoption that has to be reversed. And finally, there's a a girl who dies. This is all done tastefully and off screen, yeah, as you would expect in the 1940s, but I imagine anyone who, who has an issue with that is going to find this a painful movie to watch, and that's why I'm amazed this was ever made. It uh, didn't get particularly good reviews, it didn't do particularly well. 
it did get Cary Grant an Oscar nomination for Best Actor, and Cary Grant, you know, in my estimation, could have gotten one almost every time he appeared in a movie because he was a, such a fine film actor. And, but it's a serious stuff for 1940s. This is, you know, you, you wonder what, what demographic they thought they could shoot for. Maybe they were doing it for art because it certainly doesn't sound like entertainment. No, I, it's, uh, well, it's, it's, I think your audience will, will find it sentimental. Well, I know they'll find it sentimental. I went online and this movie has its champions and it has its detractors and they are two different camps, not see eye to eye. And, uh, you know, you can call it syrupy and sappy and, you know, a cheap tug at the heartstrings. You can call it, a, you know, a serious attempt by, by major movie makers. I mean, George Stevens was not a minor leaguer by now. He was on his way up, but he, was, he had directed some major films. Uh, Cary Grant was a big star then. Irene Dunn, though, I don't, my guess is not many of your viewers remember her today. Irene Dunn was a big star through the 1930s and 40s. Uh, it's always, a, you know, it's always a mystery to me why some actors and actors basically are iconic, you know, so many years after they've, they've their careers ended, like Cary Grant, and others who were just as popular uh, at the time, like Irene Dunn, are, you know, by the, uh, except for people like me, are pretty much forgotten. Well, Irene uh, Dunn had yeah. five Oscar nominations. If she had won an Oscar, maybe she'd be remembered better. She had five Oscar nominations? Five Oscar nominations. I didn't know that until I started reading up on this, this movie. See, Irene was all done by the time I became aware. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just couldn't resist. It's a bad joke night, Joe. <laughs> okay. You have to cut me off because we have another movie to do now. Tonight, it, right? it wasn't a whodunit, was it? No, it wasn't a whodunit because you know who done it. Irene done it. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think this might have caught uh, movie goers at the time unawares because... Uh, Cary Grant had had uh, a couple of big hits before. This one and two of them with Irene Dunn, both screwball comedies. One about uh, one called The Awful Truth, which is about a couple getting who are getting divorced and keep uh, trying to sabotage their attempts to have uh, a new love life. Another one called My Favorite Wife, and you can pretty much guess that screwball comedies, big hits, made uh, them both bigger stars than they were. And then along comes this movie, which is you know really going for the tears, and. Um, uh, and, and, you know, you've got to wonder, what, what were they thinking? You know, this was not appealing to a mass audience. And people, I, I imagine people found it very uncomfortable. I imagine, you know, as I, as I said, anyone that has issues, that has uh, sensitive to the topic of loss of child is going to find this a hard movie to sit through. Uh, Cary Grant, let me point out one thing that, you know, people know Cary Grant, but a lot of them don't know that he was one of the first stars to say, I don't want to renew my studio contract, I'll go freelance. And this is in an age and the pinnacle of, of becoming an actor in Hollywood was to have a studio contract. But he was so enormous. Uh, well, he wasn't enormous yet. I mean, he, he did this, uh, you know, we, we look back on our, he's a legendary icon. Uh, you know, Gable, Gable was enormous. Tracy was enormous. They were both at MGM. Cagney, Bogart, and Robinson are all at Warner, Warner Brothers. You know, uh, Gary Cooper's at Paramount. But Ga uh, Cary Grant, you know, did a did a stint with uh, Columbia. Did a stint with, I believe, it was RKO. And then he said, "No, I can do better on my own." And and God bless him, he did. And uh, and I, you know, I. Uh, I, my guess is the public didn't feel this way yet, but I think people in the industry thought he was so good. You know, directors said, you know, he can handle this part. I, mean, I imagine there was a lot of directors, uh, Hitchcock among them, who would, uh, Hitchcock always said he was the only, oh, well, Hitchcock was being a bit facetious, saying the only actor I ever loved. But they would look at it and say, I have a role and only Gary Grant, Grant only Cary Grant can play it the way I want it played. And... Um, Frank, we're going to only have one minute left. I'm sorry. Okay, movie number two for two weeks from tonight, a week from tonight, is Scarlet Street, a film noir where you guys always go back to, directed by Fritz Lang. Fritz Lang, think of the three M's. Metropolis, a movie entitled M, which made Peter Lorre a star, and Dr. Mabuse, who was a master criminal. Uh, Fritz Lang has made all three of those movies already. He's, uh, his best work is behind him, but he has some very interesting films ahead of him. And Scarlet Street is one of them about a nevish uh, uh, bookkeeper who falls in love with a girl which is quite beneath him, but it excites him, and, and it leads to his ruin. And let's talk about it again next week.
Oh, we are talking. I thought we only. I thought we were two weeks. Well, movies this week. Well, I'm running out of time. I got to run. Okay, I'll All right. talk to you next week. Thanks. Bye. Bye bye. And uh, views and opinions on visual radio are those of the guests and the host, and not necessarily those of Wing Cam, board, staff, members, and all our affiliate stations. Thank you.